The Pacific Northwest is a region that is able to support a diverse array of plant, animal, and mycelium species in its lush forests. I've repeatedly heard that the biodiversity here is startling and something extremely special. Many people prize the forest and honor those who live there. I, for one, have always loved to visit the forests of Washington since I was little, but it hasn't been until recently that I've had the background needed to fully understand and identify with our forest friends. For example, I had no idea how licorice fern loves big leaf maple, how oyster mushroom loves red alder, or how Douglas fir will grow a 9 inch thick bark so it will still be standing after a fire. I also never knew about the way that fungi and trees will help each other grow and thrive and send resources to each other by communicating through their roots. Some fungi are understood to be mycorrhizal, meaning that they form colonies around the fine roots of the trees in the surrounding soil, absorbing water and nutrients and effectively extending the tree's root network. In exchange for these nutrient grabbing services, the host trees will give the mycorrhizal mycelium the carbohydrates to require since they can't photosynthesize. This entire relationship happens completely underground, at least until fruiting season. I'm sure there are a whole host of delicious and delightful mycorrhizal mushrooms that people would love to hear about, but I only have information about one, and oh what a good one it is. Chanterelles are one of the most sought after wild mushrooms in the culinary world as of late, and around 30% of international chanterelle market is harvested in the Pacific Northwest. We even have our own special variety of chanterelle that doesn't live anywhere else, Cantharellus formosus, the Pacific Golden Chanterelle. You can recognize it by its cream to golden yellow color, trumpet-esque stipe, and a top like a fancy little fan. If you look at the gills, you might notice that they are larger than most gold mushrooms, and they feature a cross vein webbing. The cap of the mushroom can be anywhere from 2 to 14 centimeters, depending on its age, and its stem can range from 4 to 8 centimeters. The Pacific Golden Chanterelle grows in the forests of southeast Alaska, through Vancouver and Vancouver Island, down to Washington State, Oregon, and Northern California, although it is particularly abundant in Washington and Oregon. Chanterelles tend to grow at lower elevations with sparse ground plant coverage and lots of carpets of feather mosses. The chanterelle likes to form mycorrhizal associations with Douglas fir and western hemlock, primarily those growing in productive second growth forests that are still quite young, averaging around 35 to 60 years. Chanterelles have also been reported by logging sites and other disturbed areas. Cantharellus formosus is considered an incredibly long-lived fungi. Its fruiting bodies grow very slowly, only around 2 to 5 centimeters per month, and it continuously grows over the course of a month or two months before they're ready to drop their spores. For contrast, many mushroom species have fleshes that are ready to drop their spores over the course of a week or two. Continuous moisture is thought to be incredibly important for its continual growth. The seasonal fruiting period is often dependent on the amount of previous rainfall and humidity, and could also explain why it is often found in mossy areas. Its typical fruiting season begins in late September for our region, although there is some variation to this. You may find chanterelles begin fruiting earlier or later depending on your elevation. For quite some time, there was a scientific misconception that the Pacific Golden Chanterelle, Cantharellus formosus, was the same as the European Chanterelle, Cantharellus sabarius. They are quite similar, although our Pacific Chanterelle is larger. Unfortunately, most of the recorded uses of the Pacific Golden Chanterelle come from the white colonizers that initially mistook it for their own variety of chanterelle. The only piece of information I could find about indigenous uses is that the Kashaya Pomo people would bake the mushrooms on hot stones or fry them with onions. They traditionally inhabited an area of northwestern California just to left of Sacramento, and are still there today. Even though indigenous information is lacking, there is an abundance of information about Cantharellus formosus stemming from European scientists, in part with overlap on Cantharellus sabarius until it was discovered that the species are separate. Golden chanterelles are one of the highest dietary sources of vitamin D, right up there with cod liver oil. Also, I didn't even know that this was a thing, but one serving of cod liver oil literally provides like 340% of your daily value of vitamin D, which is super wild. I also couldn't find any sources that would conclusively give me a range of how many IUs of vitamin D could be found in chanterelles, but it's up there. A super interesting study actually found that exposure to sunlight can increase the level of vitamin D production five to seven times the normal amount. This finding can help explain why vitamin D concentrations can vary considerably from chanterelle to chanterelle, but even chanterelles with a comparatively small amount of vitamin D have quite a lot. Vitamin D levels even remain quite high for up to six years when the mushrooms are dried, meaning it would be a great option to use as a supplement in regions with dark or cloudy winters. Looking at you, Pacific Northwest! Before you go out and pluck up clusters of chanterelles to cure your seasonal depression, you need to know about sustainable harvest guidelines. Remember that chanterelles are mycorrhizal, meaning they form associations with trees that are mutually beneficial. 
This means that the chanterelles need trees to grow. Excessive clear cuts can obviously harm the trees, but also starves the mycelium. It is somewhat debated whether cutting or plucking the stems is a better way to harvest these golden delights, but a recent extended study found that cutting the stems will allow new fruiting bodies to grow on the cut stem, allowing a more plentiful chanterelle fruiting season. Several researchers have found that the amount of mushrooms that are picked will not affect the number of mushrooms as it will be the following year, but it's still very important to leave the young chanterelles to continue to grow so they will have the opportunity to drop their spores. As previously mentioned, it takes much longer for chanterelles to reach maturity than other edible fungi, so it is more likely that they will not have had the opportunity to drop their spores if you harvest the babies. As a general guideline, leave any mushrooms with a cap that is less than the width of a pizza roll. Here's a ruler for scale in case numbers make sense to you. Many mushroom harvesters opt to use a mesh or otherwise hold bag to allow the picked mushrooms to release their spores as you harvest. Although there is no concrete scientific evidence to support this, it does no harm to try. One major thing not to do is to step heavily on the ground as you're harvesting the mushrooms. This is because with each step as you harvest, you may be crushing the chanterelle primordia, or the pre-developing mushroom that has yet to break the ground surface. This will prevent the mushroom from fruiting that year's season, but won't have a long-term impact after that. As far as permits go, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The best course of action is to call the district manager of the area you plan to visit and ask specifically about necessary permits, harvest limits, seasons, and any other particular rule that their specific district may enforce. Much of the time, personal use harvesting permits are free, but you still need to obtain one so that the district can know how many individuals are harvesting for sustainability information. Now onto the recipe. I decided to make a chanterelle tart. Several people that I revealed this to were very upset about the sound of this, but I promptly informed them that a tart is simply defined as an open pastry case containing a filling. It does not have to be sweet, nor does it have to be filled with custard. This one was a puff pastry shell filled with sautéed chanterelles, tomatoes, and goat cheese, and it was very delightful. Now step one is to make our dough. The recipe I used called for two sticks of butter, but for some reason I ended up using two and a half. I don't think this is a conscious decision, I think I'm just bad at math, but I can't regret the inclusion of extra butter. My butter was semi-frozen and super difficult to cut. I would probably recommend letting yours come to fridge temperature before proceeding. I really struggled measuring out the flour. I tried to speed it up so you wouldn't have to watch, but it still seems like I'm measuring for a very long time. I honestly don't have any suggestions here. Maybe you don't pour it, I guess. Also you need two cups. Salt two-ish pinches. Now give her a whirl. Plop in your butter and mix it around so it can get totally coated in the flour. Next you'll need half a cup of cold water. The recipe says ice water, but I keep a bottle of water in my fridge so I just use that. Pretty quickly I realized this was not a job for the whisk, but it is one that will require you to get your hands dirty. So, get in there and knead the hell out of that dough. You're going to knead and knead and knead for quite a bit until she forms a nice little ball. You're supposed to split it into two little flattened dough balls and wrap it up, but I forgot to do this, so I have one very large and unflattened dough ball. Ignore this, I am not a role model. Put your dough baby in the fridge. Give it two taps before you close the door to let it know you want it to have a nice nap. Gently retrieve your dough baby from the fridge. Prep the counter with a nicely sized handful of flour. Ideally, your dough will already be in two smushed rounds, so this step is just me catching up. You're gonna roll out your dough until you can fold it in thirds. Keep rolling it out and folding it at least five or six times. The more time to do it, the more your pastry is gonna puff up. Once you've rolled and almost dropped your pastry, you can wrap it up again and leave it in the fridge until you wanna use it. It should rest for at least a couple hours, but it is better to leave it for a day or two. Give it two rubs instead of pats so it knows it will have a longer rest this time. Preheat your oven up to 400 degrees. I know I turned it to 425, but once again, I was not reading the recipe. It's tomato time. Slice them all in halves. Put some oil in a skillet. Less than this, I put in quite a lot. I'm adding my tomatoes first because Jennifer was so kind as to let me use some chanterelles she harvested last fall. They're already cooked, so I'm letting my tomatoes catch up a little bit. Ideally, don't let yours catch up quite this much. I'm adding some sea salt, black pepper, thyme, and rosemary before adding the mushrooms from Jennifer. I forgot to let them defrost, so they were still in puck form, but not for long. 
pretty soon and we've got some nice juicy sizzling chanterelles. Now they're done cooking and I'm going to take the pan off the heat. Next we want to very lightly oil the baking pan and place our dough. I'm spreading a bit of goat cheese on the base because goat cheese is delicious. Next, our mushroom and tomato mixture. And finally, some more goat cheese. Pop that baby in the oven for like 25 minutes and she should come out looking golden and flaky. Oh, look at that. No, do not let your friend eat it before you add the arugula. And it is required to retrieve your arugula from the fridge like this. I have nothing else to say. Now that the pastry has been arugula you can allow your impatient friend to have the first bite to make sure it will satisfy your taste buds before eating, and also that it is not so hot that it will burn your tongue. If they make a promising face like that one, it's probably safe to eat. My face conveys very little emotion here, but the pastry turned out quite flaky and delightful. The mushrooms were delicious paired with the creaminess of the goat cheese and the acidity of the tomato and the bitters of the arugula just tied the whole thing together. But honestly, how could chanterelles not taste good?